He was a scholar and expert in Quran, Hadith. He studied in Yemen, Morocco, Khurasan. Allahu Akbar, he used to travel distances more than two months, four months with his friends to learn knowledge. And on top of that, he had extreme financial difficulties to the point where he never asked for any money from anybody. And people offered him scholars, the government, the Khalifas, friends. Imam Ahmed never accepted anything from anybody until he died. His uncle, he used to work for the government and he used to write letters to the Khalifa, Harun al-Rashid. And a long time passed and Harun and the Harun Rashid sent a letter to his uncle saying, where are all the letters? You're meant to report to me. He's writing reports about people, what they're doing, what they're not doing. So like spying. The uncle said, I sent them all through, through Ahmed. He said, I never received anything. So they called Ahmed along. Imagine 12, 13 year old boy now coming before the Khalifa and he's asking him, where are all the letters? Uncle says, I gave you them all from years, five years ago. He says, I threw them all in the Tigris River. He said, why? He said, in it are backbiting and spying on other people. And this is haram. I refuse to do it. The uncle got a little bit upset. The Khalifa looked at him and said, don't. He said, if this young boy has that much piety, how can we compare ourselves to him? He is an example to us. Khalifa Harun al-Rashid said this. Everybody envied this teenager. The perception of Imam Ahmad is that of rigidity, unfortunately. When people say Ahmad ibn Hanbal or Hanbali, it is so sad that people attach him and his school of thought to rigidity, strictness, ultra-religious. And Imam Ahmad was also one of those like the other Imams who was accused. Allah bears witness of greatness to himself that there is no God worthy of worship but him. And he bears witness to the greatness of his creation of the angels. And he bears witness to the importance and greatness of those endued with knowledge. He was born in the year 164 Hijri, born in Baghdad, died in Baghdad. And he was born in the year when Imam Malik died. But Imam Ahmad started his knowledge at the age of 15 years. Imam Ahmad was one of those, just like Imam Shafi and Imam Malik, his inspiration and his channel into knowledge was his mother. Imam Ahmad raised by his mother. And Imam Ahmad came from a tribe called Banu Shayban. And the mother of Imam Ahmad was extremely wise and she spent so much on her son in knowledge and wisdom. She stayed single all her life after the death of her husband, raising and teaching her son, Imam Ahmad. And Imam Ahmad loved his mother so immensely. He had a special spot in his heart. In fact, he was 21 years old. And one day he was walking with one of his friends. And he said to him, let's cross the Tigris River. For some reason. And he said to him, no, my mother told me never to cross the Tigris River. Today, a 21 year old who says, my mom doesn't let me. Imagine what happens to them. She gave up her life. You won't believe this, but Imam Ahmed, because he loved his mother so much, and he knew the sacrifice she had done for him, he did not marry so long as his mother was alive. Because he also wanted to dedicate his time and his years for his mother. For Allah first, then his mother, until she died, rahmatullah alayha, and he was at the age of 40. He married at the age of 40, subhanallah. His first wife was Aisha, Umm Salih. She lived with him for 30 years. In these 30 years, her and I never disagreed on a single word. After she died, Imam Ahmad married another wife. Her name was Rayhan. 
and from her was his second son Abdullah. Salih and Abdullah became scholars and muhaddithin. Imam Ahmad, after Rayhana, she died as well and he lived on. He married again and he had two children after the age of 74 years. He died at 77. And his kids were still babies when he died, rahmatullahi alayhi. As for Imam Ahmad, what he looked like, he was an Arab, tall, dark. He dyed his hair with hinna. He was very clean, well-groomed. He memorized the whole Qur'an at a young age. And he was among the few youngsters who read and wrote. Imam Ahmad was the top in his rank in Hadith. The middle or the balanced amount that it is, he is said to have memorized is 700,000. He produced these hadiths in a famous book called Kitab al-Musnad. Imam Ahmad, what a determined man. Someone who makes a decision and sticks to it to the end. His first teacher was, guess who? Was Abu Yusuf al-Qadi, who was the first student of Imam Abu Hanifa. His second teacher, Haytham ibn Jumayl. The third teacher he had was Yazid ibn Hurawain, and he was a very powerful and influential <coughs> teacher, Yazid. As for the fourth teacher, was Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi, the scholar who encouraged a Shafi'i. His fifth teacher, Waqi' ibn al Jarrah. His sixth teacher was Abdul Razak ibn Huma from Mecca. Seventh teacher was Imam al Shafi'i. And it was Imam al Shafi'i who was his greatest and most influential and loved teacher of all of them. Imam Ahmad said, I have never made more dua more than for Imam al Shafi'i. He said to his son, My son al Shafi'i was like the sun to the world. And he was the medicine and health for people. So look, can you find that you can be without the sun and without health? No. He also said about Imam al Shafi'i, I make dua for a Shafi'i in my salat. Every prayer for 40 years he used to say, Oh my Lord, forgive me and my parents, and Muhammad, son of Idris al Shafi'i. In Mecca, Imam Ahmad went there one day, and he was still in his uh, you know, 20s or so, so he's a young man. Imam al Shafi'i was still in his early times, wasn't very popular yet. And he had a friend by the name of Yahya ibn Ma'in, and he was his friend in, in lessons, in study. When they used to go to Mecca, there was a teacher named Sufyan ibn Uyayna. So if one day, uh, his friend Yahya ibn Mu'ayn, he noticed that Imam Ahmad was not in the circle with them with Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna. Sufyan ibn Uyayna, an extraordinary scholar of his time and even till today. He looked and he saw Imam Ahmad, the young man, sitting in, one of the, in the circle of Imam al-Shafi'i. Now at that time, Yahya did not know who Imam al-Shafi'i was, he wasn't popular yet. He just looked like a Bedouin, just like a Bedouin, Imam Shafi'i. He thought, what's Imam Ahmad sitting with a Bedouin? He went there and he sat with Ahmad and just a few people around his circle. He said, yeah, Imam, what are you doing, Ahmad? He said, come here, come here, he said to Yahya. He said, listen to this man. He said, but Sufya, Imam Sufya, he goes, just listen, just listen for a second. He sat down and listened and he said, it's impressive. He said, but why did you leave Imam Sufyan, Abu Uyayna, to come to a man, a Bedouin? He said, with Imam Sufyan, if you listen to him, and you missed out something, you can ask him tomorrow. As for this man, the words you hear for him, if you don't hear him first time, you will never hear them from anyone again. This man is something different. Yahya said, but, okay. He went and sat back with Sufyan. Afterwards, only in a matter of about two or three years, Imam al-Shafi'i's circle was the largest in all of Mecca, and everybody left all the circles and sat with Imam al-Shafi'i. What does that tell you about Imam Ahmad? He had a, uh, a foresight. And so he became his great teacher. The trial in his time. He went through a trial more than any other Imam went through of this issue called the creation of the Quran. There was a group called the Mu'tazila. And they started off even before from the time of Abu Hanifa, but they never came up until really until the time of Imam Ahmad where they really started to show. Now, what happened? This group of people came along and they said the Quran is not the word of Allah, it is the creation of Allah. 
because speech is created and speech was came after Allah therefore the Quran is speech and it is created like you and me it is not the words of Allah so therefore they implying the words of Allah are not perfect and they said they used their words and their evidences of philosophy in Alm al-Kalam they came out in the time of Harun al-Rashid then he died Al-Khalifa al-Ma'moon came up and then Al-Mu'tasim his brother followed by his son Al-Wathiq so Al-Ma'moon was the first he first he didn't believe in that but there was uh, a man who came out he was a faqih he understood scholar in religion but he was affected by the philosophy and the uh, dialectics of the Greeks and so on and so forth he made up this thing and he came to the Khalifa Al-Ma'mun and he convinced him about the Khalq of the Qur'an Al-Khalifa Al-Ma'mun unfortunately even though he was a very learned man he influenced him and he believed what he believed at first Al-Khalifa Al-Ma'mun did not impose it on people he said I believe in this but he didn't impose it but then this man no you have to tell the people this is part of Aqid and I have to agree on it and if they don't agree it is disbelief so then after three years Al-Ma'mun stood up on this rampage he said everybody must accept it and he came to all his workers and his government officials and he said start with my judges and start with the scholars that work for me they have to believe in it about 30,000 Imams it's halal because of their lives yielded they all said the Quran is created only a number of them some of them they did a trick they said the Quran the Zabur the Zams and the Torah these four are created meaning my four fingers the government understood the Khalifa liked it and he said well okay finally came Imam Ahmad and three friends of his were contemporaries they came to him and they asked him the question what do you say they said the Quran is the word of Allah not created the Khalifa ordered that they be put in chains and brought as prisoners when they came to that two of his friends the ulama they yielded they said no no it's created they couldn't withstand it our family our children and they were left behind then it was Imam Ahmed and his favorite friend Yahya ibn Ma'in Yahya ibn Ma'in was resilient they put the chains in him and on their way but even Yahya yielded on his way Imam Ahmed this is now where the Karamat come in on his way he made a dua he said oh Allah oh Allah do not let me meet Ma'mun the second day they came back and they said you have to be returned why he said your sentence has been su suspended the Khalifa died but before that Al Mu'tasim his brother took over Al Mu'tasim was not a scholar he was a military commander so he was tough was ruthless and his brother al mamun he loved him a lot al mamun before he died requested him he said make sure that there is no alim or judge except that you make sure that he believes and says that the quran is created al mu'tasim did not care about anything else all he wanted is to carry out his brother's order my brother said and i'm going to do it i don't care who it is and so he carried it out again and so imam ahmad is brought into chains one more time on his way subhanallah it was not a, an alim it was not a scholar or a shaykh or a judge who came to him to give him strength you know who came to him a simple Bedouin who hardly knows anything even reading or writing he came up to him and he said yeah imam I hear that you have been summoned to say that the Quran is created yeah imam stand strong never say these words imam Ahmad said Allah this is from Allah a support Allah is sending a Bedouin from the desert which scholar is going to do all the scholars said we yield a better one from the desert and he was brought before the Khalifa in Baghdad it was hot it was deadly it was Ramadan al Mu'tasim was fasting Imam Ahmad was fasting he was put into the prison and then he was brought out on the first day al Mu'tasim tried to yield he said yeah Imam please you are a respected person I'll let you go say what they are saying say what your friend said Yahya he said but even then I stick to what I have to say he's determined 
Ya Imam, please. Ya Imam, please. And the Imam Ahmed said to Khalifa, he said, Ya Khalifa, Ya Amir al muminin So he acknowledged his Imara. Said to him, give me one evidence from the Quran that the Quran is created. I cannot find any evidence. Give me evidence and I'll accept. al Mu'tasim couldn't find anything. Then he said, take him to the prison. He went. Second day he came out. And this time, Ahmed ibn Abi Du'ad and his scholars around there. Ahmed ibn Abi Du'ad went into a debate with him. He said, I have evidence from the Qur'an that the Qur'an is created. He said, which one? He said, Allah says, we have sent this Qur'an down in the Arabic language. Imam Ahmed looked at him and said, Allah did not say we have created the Qur'an in the Arabic language. He said, we have sent down the Qur'an in Arabic language. This does not mean it is created. Then they went into a debate. And the debate went on and there is no evidence. And Imam Ahmad is reciting his evidence as if he could read them before his eyes even though he was in chains. As for Al-Mu'tasim, he's watching. He didn't care whether he's right or wrong. All he cared about was carry out the bequest of his brother. That's it. They put him back in the prison. Third day, fourth day, fifth day. Imam Al-Mu'tasim is trying to yield. Please, I'll let you go with your family. Just say it and I'll let you go. Imam Ahmad determined, I will not say it. This is deen. It's not my religion. It's the religion of Allah. The whip was brought out. They whipped him. And he would resort to dua and supplications and he would go unconscious. The doctor would say, I would have to take remnants of the ropes out of his body with knives. And sometimes I would have to cut out meat on the knives of his, of his back. And he stood firm. He was fasting in Ramadan while being whipped and his back was seeping pus and blood and he would not break his fast and the people would give him water those who were whipping him say drink and he would say wallahi I will not drink I'm fasting I wish to meet my Lord if I die like this I wish to meet him fasting man of determination ya Ami. this is something unbelievable but he didn't die then they saw him after a few days of whipping and this is in history they saw him say some words they couldn't understand it but one of the writers says Later on, I understood what he was saying. He was saying, Oh Allah, do not let my aura show. His pants were slipping off. All this mattered not to him except that his aura would show. The person who's writing says, Wallahi, I saw his pants by themselves somehow make their way up and they were tight on his body and never fell. When he entered the prison with his pain and torture, he would stay up in the night praying. Another support from Allah came to him. A man who was imprisoned for drinking alcohol, he came up to him and he said to him, Ya Imam, I have been whipped 40 lashes each time for drinking alcohol. I have now been in prison for four years because I drink alcohol. And I cannot resist my alcohol. And I have resisted the whipping for four years because of something haram alcohol. He says, you are resisting the whipping. For the sake of Allah, do not give in. If I resist it for alcohol, you can resist it for something for Allah. And Imam Ahmad said, Allahu Akbar, this is more support from Allah. No scholar, no pious person, no one. A drunk, an alcoholic, and a Bedouin from the middle of the desert who knows nothing of reading and writing except sheep and camel and goats and their feces. This is where the support came from. So he made friends with all the prison inmates. This man is subject, I'm talking about 13 or 14 years of his life, imprisoned and out. One man came to him and they felt sorry for him. And he said to him, Ya Imam, just get yourself out of this. We can't bear seeing you like this. He looked at him and he said, Are you a student of knowledge? He said, Yes. He said, Look outside the window of this small door of this prison. He looked outside and he said, What do you see? He said, I see people I cannot count in numbers. Thousands and thousands of people waiting outside. They are carrying feathers of pens and writing material that they write on. He said to them, they are students of knowledge. They are waiting for what I have to say. And for the generations to come in the future, this is what the knowledge will be. I am the last standing on this. I must stand firm. The Khalifa Al-Mu'tasim died. And the Al-Wathiq, his son, took over. Same thing, was affected by. But this time Al-Wathiq, he looked at Imam and he saw that there was social issue. He didn't want an uprising against him. 
Because the people, the amounts of people who were sympathizing with Imam Ahmad were too many. So he had to stop the torture and take off his chains. For several years, Imam Ahmad taught the students from behind bars. Until finally, one day, he stood him up and, him, and this Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad was standing there. al wathiq was sitting. Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad, he came up to him and said, just say it, whisper it to my ear and I'll let you go. Whisper it, I have a connection with the Khalifa. No one understood this Imam. This Imam didn't care about you or you or you. He died in this cause. Then he said to him, Ya Ahmad, give me one evidence and I will follow you. He said, the most merciful, he taught the Quran. Imam Ahmad said, Allah did not say, Ar-Rahman created the Quran. He said, Allam al-Quran. He taught the Quran. This is not evidence. Then he said to him these words. He said, Rasul Sallallahu is silent about it. Abu Bakr is silent about it. Umar is silent about it. And do you think you're better than the Prophet Sallallahu Abu Bakr and Umar to talk it? They stayed silent. Why can't you stay silent? And that's when it was the last straw. Al-Wathiq started to think with his head, the Khalifa. It says in the, in the uh, narration that Al-Wathiq started laughing so badly that he, he fell back and lifted his leg up saying, <laughs> Ya Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad, the Prophet and Abu Bakr and Umar, they stayed silent and you had to open your big mouth. Until finally, Al-Wathiq looked at it and he said, this is rubbish. Al-Wathiq died, but he didn't release him and, and announce it. Another Khalifa came up and he said, what is this? He released Imam Ahmad and he came to the Mu'tazila and he stopped them where they were and the whole of the city, Al Khalifa announced that the Mu'tazila are rejected and refused and this Imam has shown their, their wrong and then the people of the Medina of the whole city came from Baghdad and the Imams and all those who whipped him and tortured him seeking his forgiveness. Imam Ahmad announced he said, I forgive every person, every Khalifa, every person who instigated this, every person who whipped me. And I forgive them with all my heart, except the Mu'tazila. Even when he was dying on his deathbed, he was unconscious. And Abdullah, his son, heard his father saying, not yet, not yet. And his son said, what do you mean? No, you don't want to meet Allah yet? Then when he awoke, he said to him, the shaitan came to me saying to me, you have gone away from my trickery. I, can't, I couldn't do anything to you. And I said to him, not yet. The war between you is not over yet. You're trying to trick me so I can put my guards down. Imam Ahmad, even to the last minute, determined. said, the war between me and you is not over yet. Don't flatter me. What happened after him was a disaster. His students became overzealous and they began to become too rigid, too strict, beyond measure. Saying, some of them even went to the extent of saying, after the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, no one is more important or valuable or pious than Imam Ahmad. They went to the extent of saying, there is no greater faqih than Imam Ahmad on the face of the earth. So much so that taking the law into their own hands, going beyond the Khalifa, they would instigate something in order to prove the madhab of Imam Ahmad to be right, just to pick up a fight. His son Salih married a wealthy woman and he bought some expensive furniture about 4,000 dirhams. One day a fire lit up in his house and burnt all the furniture and everything. And this was after his father's death. Imam Salih said, he said, I am not upset because my furniture was burnt, but because I kept this garment which my father used to wear and he gave it to me after his death. Every time I prayed, I wore it. Every time I went to the masjid, I wore it. Every time I gave a halaqa, I wore it. So he entered into his house and he saw everything burnt. He looked and guess what? He found the garment unburnt. <laughs>